Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead. Controlled burns, or prescribed fires, are one of the most wildlife beneficial tools that our biologists have to improve habitat. It speeds up the process of returning nutrients back into the soil, which then in turn lets more wildlife beneficial plants come up. Fire is also one of the most effective ways to control eastern red cedars from taking over. It's only necessary to burn a spot every few years, so our biologists create schedules to rotate through and burn different sections of our WMAs every year. A wildlife department committed to do what it takes to make our public lands some of the best managed habitat in the country. Just another reason to love Oklahoma and the adventures that await you. A lot of folks use this springtime as a reminder to get out there and go outdoors. And a great alarm clock for when we should start going outdoors is when the red buds start to bloom. That's a good reminder of when the crappie are about to spawn, the sand bass are starting to run, the paddlefish are running, the, the morel mushrooms are starting to grow. But a lot of folks don't realize that that red bud blossom is actually edible. You can eat it straight off the tree or you can turn it into things. It has a, a light floral taste and a little bit sweet. Today, we're gonna to take those flavors and elevate them even more by turning those blossoms into red bud jelly. The first thing that you'll need to do is pick a whole bunch of blossoms. I've got here about four cups. Now, with that, we're gonna take those, I've got a bowl here, and we're gonna dump all those blossoms in. Now, if you've got a couple of pieces of stem or leaves or anything like that, it's not a big deal. We're actually gonna take and strain this once we're done. Got a pot of water that's boiling over here on the stove with about four cups of water in it. We're gonna take these four cups and slowly pour it over those blossoms, letting them all get nice and soaked in. Perfect. Now it's gonna, at first, look a little bit green. We're gonna actually put some saran wrap over this and let it sit for at least 24 hours. And in that time, all of that natural pigment of those flowers is gonna come out into the water and we're gonna turn that into like a red bud tea. And that's what we'll use to actually make the jelly. So, I'm gonna put some saran wrap on here. Get it nice and tight. Then we're gonna slide this guy into the fridge. Uh, I've actually got one that I did yesterday so that we would be able to have some to work with today. So we'll slide this guy into the fridge real quick and grab that other one and we'll be good to go. So the first thing that we will need to do after we've sat for 24 hours is take our saran wrap off and then I've got a strainer here and then just a, a large glass measuring bowl. That way we can see how much tea we're actually gonna get. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is take this bowl and slowly pour it in. And we'll start to get all those buds out and into the strainer. So once we've got a good amount of them in there and it's full, we can start to slowly press down on that and it's okay if a few fall in there because we'll probably strain this a couple of times just to make sure we don't end up with anything in there. Great. Now we'll add the last little bit that's in there. Make sure we get all of the red bud tea out. Outstanding. Then we'll simply toss these in the trash. Now we can go a couple times here and strain it back through. Just so we're being sure to get all those little spots out because we won't want those in our jelly. Perfect. We're right about four cups. So four cups of tea is gonna be the basis of our recipe. It's pretty simple. We'll take four cups of the red bud tea, four cups of sugar. We'll use six teaspoons of the sure gel or, or pectin 
And then we'll also use four teaspoons of lemon juice. We'll put all those in the pot here. We're gonna go ahead and let this sugar start to um, dissolve into this tea and we're gonna move it over to the stove. Once we've warmed up a little bit, we're gonna add the sure gel in. Now, while this is actually warming up, is a great time to start working on getting your jars put into your water bath. We wanna do that so that the, the jars are all sanitary. Whenever we're dealing with making jams or canning or anything like that, we wanna make sure that the, the jars are nice and clean so that we can have them uh, on our shelves in our pantry for 18 months or more to be able to use them down the road. We're gonna open up our water bath. Now, in this water canner, you can use a, a stove or a, a stock pot or anything like that, but you wanna have a wire basket in there so that you, um, you're not letting the jars touch the bottom of the container. That'll actually make them break. So we don't want that. We can come in with our jars and we basically just want to let them get nice and hot so that they all become sanitary. So once all those are in there, we're just going to let them have a nice little steam bath and we will uh, let all that come up to temperature. So once we've added in the six tablespoons of pectin or sure gel, we're going to let that dissolve into our sugary tea and let that come to a hard boil for one minute. And a hard boil is basically a boil you can't stir down, so it'll kind of froth up. Um, once that's done, we're gonna turn the fire off and move it over onto the counter. So we've brought this pot over from the stove after we've got our good hard boil, and we're gonna let it cool just a little bit while we're moving our jars over here in a minute. But you'll notice I've put a towel down on the counter. That's gonna let the jars cool down a little bit more slowly as, as the jelly's transferred into it. The making the jelly's done. Now we just need time on our side. Um, but again, we want to have this jelly around for 18 months on our, in our pantry. So I'm going to go pull the jars off of the stove. To do that, you'll actually want some, some jar tongs to be able to pull those out. From here, take our ladle and we will start to try to not make a mess, ladle these into the jars. Now, um, we want to make sure to not overfill these. And so there's actually a tool called a headspace gauge to make sure that we have the right headspace. Each recipe for jelly has a little bit different uh, headspace that it wants. For red bud jelly, they want about a quarter inch of headspace. So we want to make sure that we're not overfilling them. That's perfect. And you don't have to measure every one of them. Once you've got one measured, you can kind of use it as a reference as you're going through and filling the rest of your jars. All right, our jelly's all transferred. Put our pot in the sink. Now, for the actual canning part. Move some of this stuff out of the way here so it's not in our way when we start to can. Now, with a jar, there's really three parts. There's the jar, the ring, and then the lid, which are in the pot boiling behind me. So I'm gonna pull one of the lids, or set it on there, and then we'll put the rings on there. Now we're gonna go back into the water canner or the hot water bath, this time for 10 minutes once it gets up to a boil. So we're gonna open that up again, using our tongs, because those jars are still pretty warm, especially with the jelly in them. And we're gonna slowly transfer them back into the hot water bath. Now with this, you wanna have enough water in there that the jars are gonna have at least an inch of water over the top. That way they're gonna be allowed to fully seal. Now, when you're canning, about 10 minutes is plenty to be able to 
get a good seal. So once those jars have boiled for about 10 minutes, we'll pull them out and let them sit on the counter for about 24 hours. After that, we can put them on the pantry and enjoy them for months. So the next time that you're outdoors enjoying all that Oklahoma has to offer, whether that's fishing or hunting or foraging for mushrooms or whatever it may be, remember that there's another untapped resource that you may not have used yet, the redbud tree. So pop one of those redbuds off and taste it. Enjoy its light floral flavor and that little bit of sweet taste. If you really like it, pick a whole bunch, come home and make some redbud jelly. My name is Marty Lee. I've been an outdoors person my whole life and that's 50 plus years and I've been, um, I was taught to hunt morels as a small child so it's possible that I've been doing it for almost 50 years. I think that morel mushrooms are very special because um, they're very delicious to eat um, number one, but number two, they're special because they only uh, come up uh, during a really small window early in the spring, usually three or four weeks uh, in the spring and the morels are, are gone. It gets too hot and, and they stop uh, fruiting. So you have a very limited uh, time frame to go out and find them and that makes them extra special. One of the things that I look for when I'm looking for likely places are little drainages like this with the hillside. There's a couple more right here. When you find one, you should always search really good. When you're out hunting for morels and you're looking, scanning the leaves, um, they're gonna be very difficult to find. But when you find one, you should always stop, don't move, and look around because morels are gre gregarious. Uh, where there's one, there are typically more. Um, and where there is one, it implies that that's a spot where uh, they're more likely to be than other spots. The conditions that make one grow are gonna make several of them grow in that particular area. I haven't seen any more yet. There may not be any more, but we'll check this area pretty good before we leave. This slope right here is perfect because it's south facing. It's gonna warm up first in the spring and there's one right there behind your boot. I either cut them or pinch them. I don't pull them up because I don't want to deal with the dirt. The presumption is that if you rip them out of the ground, you're damaging the, the mycelium, the body of the mushroom that's going to provide you mushrooms year after year. You're damaging that under the ground. Uh, when you uh, rip out a mushroom by the roots, I don't necessarily, I personally don't feel that that's so important. Um, but what I don't like uh, about pulling them out of the ground is that if I leave that dirt on there and put it in my sack or my baskets, uh, I've got dirt in with my morels and it causes every, all the morels to get dirt on them and, I, and it just requires more cleaning. Morels have associations with lots of different trees. I would go to those trees that I know are in general, hosts for morels, elms, hackberries, cottonwoods, ashes. Uh, in east of I-35, uh, sycamores. In, in northeast Oklahoma, I focus my efforts mainly on sycamore trees. And I rarely find them 
elsewhere where there's not a sycamore tree. If you find one, there's gonna be a sycamore tree somewhere within 20 feet. This elm is damaged. You can see the bark peeling back here. It may just be this one limb, in particular dying trees and or uh, damaged trees, because it's important to remember that the body of um, the morel mushroom actually lives under the ground in a web of mycelia. This entire area could be um, covered with morel mycelia. And one of the things that mushroom mycelia feed off of is uh, those, those dead, and, or excuse me, those dying trees. Um, and that new, that new source of, of nutrients. And so the mushroom starts feeding on those, those dying roots um, and uh, consumes those roots. And a lot of times with a, a particular dying tree, maybe for a couple of years, uh, the morels will fruit um, incredibly around that tree and I've found flushes of morels for a couple of re uh, years around a particular tree uh, and then and then nothing they're gone now it's, it's very possible that the mycelia are still there in the ground um, but there's not enough nutrients to support the the fruiting of of the morel which is the part that we like to harvest and eat assuming we have plenty of rain and Temperatures are warming up into the 60s and 70s during the day, but it's probably most important that we have warm uh, nights. Uh, the average ground temperature when morels start fruiting is um, from 45 to 50 degrees. And typically that, that's when they'll start fruiting. A lot of people that are new to morel mushroom hunting and, and ask me questions, you know, where, where should I go look? And, you know, my vague answer is, well, just go outside and start looking. They, they can theoretically be anywhere. Um, you can find them in your backyard. You can find them at the city park. Um, you can find them... Um, uh, at your, uh, near your favorite swimming hole. If you know of an area where a lot of trees have been damaged by a storm or, and could be tornado, high winds, or ice storms, and they will flush around those damaged trees, typically not that year, but maybe the next year. Uh, same thing for a burn. If you have a friend or a colleague at work that you know uh, does it and, and has some experience and is willing to take you out and share their potentially secret spots with you, I, I think that's the best way for someone to be introduced. Um, a, a person new to morel mushroom hunting could potentially wander around in the woods uh, for two or three days without finding anything just because they may be unfamiliar with um, the particular kinds of habitats that morels like um, and someone with more experience can can look at the landscape in the woods or near a creek and say uh, right over there is potentially a good spot I, I think if if anyone is interested in getting out the most important thing to remember is that it's great to get out uh, and enjoy nature and poke around in the woods. There's no telling what you may find. You may find uh, a shed white-tailed deer antler. You may find uh, a turtle that's just come out of hibernation. Uh, in the early spring, the plants are, are are budding and starting to grow. Flowers are going to be coming on in the woods. Uh, the insects and, and uh, animals are going to be coming alive. And uh, 
even if you don't find any mushrooms, uh, there's no telling what you might be able to enjoy in the outdoors. Well, we hope today's stories remind you that Oklahoma is such a perfect place to explore. So however you choose to enjoy our state's incredible natural world, remember that your adventure starts with Outdoor Oklahoma. Outdoor Oklahoma is produced by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and is proud to serve and be funded entirely by sportsmen and women and outdoor enthusiasts who love and appreciate all things wild in the great state of Oklahoma. Is that good enough for the B-roll?